Here I am with Scott Robinson, aka the Brain Guy. Scott is a senior lecturer at the AMNA Academy, and he's the creator of Neuroflexibility. Scott offers one on one up leveling coaching sessions, and he's all about improving the mind, brain, the body, and everything else in life. Scott, how you doing? Uh, what time is it there in Australia? Oh, geez. Well, well, listen, thank you very much. Lovely introduction. Great to be here. Grateful to get to be here and, you know, get to have a chat with you. And yeah, we are, uh, it's, it's the future. It's the future here. It's, it's tomorrow morning um, as, far as, <laughs> as far as you're concerned. So yeah, no, but yeah, grateful to get to be here and, and have a, have a chat. Brilliant. I uh, followed Scott's work for a couple of years now. And uh, when I was going through my own modalities and trying to find answers about brain recovery I had stumbled upon meditation and uh, one thing led to another and I started following him and I'm really excited to figure out what his story is what is his why uh, Scott can you give us a little bit of background for those who may not know yeah, sure. And look, great question with the why. That literally just came up for me the other night and sort of went diving into that sort of a little more deeply, which is cool. So very happy to share that. But yeah, so look, I am you know, known as the brain guy on Instagram and Facebook because I basically got into kind of this game via neurology. And, you know, and that was that was my in and, and and it just made sense. It was just one of those things. I was terrible at school. You know, I really struggled to learn, you know, and and, and it still sounds really strange to me now. I have, you know, a lot of people sending me messages and using words like genius and, you know, praising intelligence and all this sort of stuff. And um, for the stuff that seems to be coming out of my mind, but, you know, for a long time, that just wasn't the case. You know, I really, really struggled to learn. I couldn't read or really, you know, I'm, I was just doing, I'm doing some work with my daughter at the moment. And I was just sharing with her the other night that, you know, daddy was terrible at school, you know, and I said, one of the things that I was most proud of was I repeated my senior year because I did so badly the first time I repeated my senior year. And I went back and just with a little bit more maturity, I had to stop and look and say, you know, I need to do this differently because whatever it is about this system isn't working for me. I need to figure out how I can get this done. How can I learn? And so I sat down and just worked out a bunch of things and you know, amongst which, you know, I always said probably my greatest achievement I felt at school was I, I just, I accepted that I couldn't read. I was just gonna have to work out a different way to do it. And so I figured out a different way to learn and I ended up winning the English prize without winning, a, without reading a single novel, mm. um, you know, but it was like just actually learning how to take in information, learning how to absorb and, um, and just beginning to sort of, you know, just explore. And so that, that just sort of opened my eyes to the fact that things were possible, but then, I said, for me, I was an athlete. I was an athlete who became a coach. And then I was a coach who was doing rehabilitation work. And, um, and, and I still had that athlete's mindset. So you're just looking for an edge. You're looking for, you know, how do I get to be the best? How do I get to do this better? How do I get better results for people? And then kind of the brain appeared. So that was neurology. And I sort of dived into that. And, and as I said, it just made sense. I can't really describe it. Whereas nothing at school had ever really made sense to me before. And nothing had ever really gone in and stuck this just felt easy. And it was just like, and then I was insatiable. All of a sudden I could read all of a sudden I could sit down and read medical papers and read scientific studies. And, you know, and I was really happy to sit there and do it. And it was all going in and it was quite, it was a really amazing. Um, and so just the exponential growth in learning, like I went through university, I was in university for a lot of years. And, you know, I, I, I think I learned more in my first year in doing neurology than I did in, you know, for six plus years at university. So that, that was just, that was amazing. And then the results that I was seeing with people in just resolving physical ailments and dysfunction and pain and movement complaints seemed really miraculous because I'd previously be just been working with kind of just the more antiquated ways of going about things or just the more, you know, habitually understood ways of going about things where we see, we just see physicality and we, so we like to try and, in our society, we like to use, you know, physical inputs. We'll use you know, movement, or we'll use a drug, or we'll use food, or, you know, we'll use movement force, you know, and we see those as the only real ways to affect things. And then like an outside uh, stimulus. Yeah, yeah. Like, so it's, and again, it's very much the way the scientific paradigm likes to see the world is that we like to see the world in terms of physical connections, and there needs to be a molecular connection, you know, there needs to be some hardwired connection to really affect change. And 
diving into the brain, I was just really blessed, really fortunate that the paradigm that I kind of went into and started looking at things in, a, in applied movement neurology, those guys just said, look, we don't know much about the brain. Everybody's really happy to admit that, really happy to admit that there's so much more that we don't know than what we do know. So they just said, you don't, there's no institutional imperatives. You don't have to make your answers or whatever you're finding. You don't have to make your findings fit any set paradigm. You can just dive in and whatever you're discovering, you can just let that unfold under its own steam so we can kind of get to the truth of this. And that was amazing. That just took the handbrakes off. And then all of a sudden you're just seeing things completely differently. And so, you know, started to then really started to resolve more and more, you know, different complaints of pain and dysfunction and illness and whatever. And, and again, that's, that just convinces you of that truth because you're seeing, you're seeing these results unfold. So it's like, you don't need to buy into your own thinking on anything. You don't need to buy into your own theories. You can just follow what's giving you results and then your understanding can catch up with it later. And so that was very much, was very much that. And then I think um, that's just continued to evolve and expand over time. So what I do, I always say what I do changes literally on a week to week basis. It's like every week I can kind of do more. And, and really my why is I just want to help. It's literally that I just, I'm just here to help. And you know, it's like we we all actually exist in oneness. You know, people talk. You know, the spiritual types and quantum physicists talk about this oneness of the universe and this oneness of the field and oneness of intelligence. And that is all very, very true. Whether you experience that or not is a different thing. That's just up to your belief system because you will experience by your own perception. Your perception is made by your belief system. And so, if you don't believe in that stuff, well, you won't experience it because you won't have the perception that'll allow you to perceive it. So but it doesn't change. It, you, you don't need to go and sit on a mountaintop for 20 years and meditate to hopefully achieve oneness with everything. You're already in oneness with everything. You just might not be experiencing it. Mm -hmm. So if I get to help, well, me helping you or me helping the next person, that's helping me. That's helping everyone. So uh, I'm, once I kind of came into that realization and that kind of awareness, well, Hey, I mean, let's, let's do this. Let's just, let's be as helpful as we possibly can. So that's kind of, that's pretty much where we're at. I love to hear it. And I can see a lot of similarities in our story. I grew up not very good at school, doubting my abilities. And when I started to learn about the brain, coincidentally, after I had brain surgery on my left frontal lobe, I had a cavernomous malformation that was removed. And that was causing me to have grand mal seizures but even after the removal of the, the little uh, piece of brain tissue that was about the size of a cranberry, I continued to have seizures and my decision-making abilities was very well, piss poor is the only way I can explain that. that that's but, a medical scientific term. Yeah. yeah. But they, the, doc, the docs, they told me, you know, mm. you're going to have to live with this brain trauma. You're going to, you're kind of going to a bit stuck here. We, there's not much we can do for you. And they had me on the seizure medications. I, I ran upon meditation and through meditation, I got a better understanding of the brain. And I had that aha moment. And I said, well, maybe we need to be teaching people not how to learn, but maybe the aspects and the fundamentals of how we actually integrate knowledge into our brains it, and that was my aha moment like you said you had um but my my why as well is to help as many people learn about the brain and the rest of the the brain body connection as i possibly can so um in in that sense i don't really fear what i do i just try to put one step to the next and see where it heads to um Perfect. And then I would say with that learning thing, because we both experienced that, I'll just give you kind of more towards the other end of the spectrum. It, when I got into neurology, it was very much dealing with brain circuits and brain areas and re being really specific about, you know, how you like the different brain areas that come up and what they do and how, how they impact, you know, on the outputs that you're experiencing. The more I went into that, the more I was able to sort of find and see that thought energy underpins all of that. You know, so what we're actually thinking in the subconscious mind actually, you know, influences all of that in huge ways. And really, 
the brain's constantly trying to go on autopilot. It's constantly trying to go back to that kind of, a, you know, a sleep state where you're just kind of running, you know, literally running on auto mm -hmm. and everything is just running programs. And it does that for reasons of survival, we believe, because, you know, that allows it to conserve more energy, which means you would have more time available to hunt and then go out and find food and then continue to stay alive, continue to survive. So that's optimal. And, and it's always trying to gravitate back to that unconscious state, that unconscious autopilot state. Now, what I found, you know, in, in kind of playing with that, and I didn't realize what I was doing initially, but it, it wasn't until like, if you, if you go and change the beliefs in the mind. And so we talk, let's talk about just fundamental capacities, like the, your ability to learn your ability to, you know, your ability to express intelligence or, or that inner genius. I can remember the first time this happened to me, I was kind of freaked out because, and, and this has happened lots and lots of times, um, in terms of feeling a bit freaked out when you see a new capacity of the brain that wasn't previously in your reality that you could actually ex experience these kinds of things. If you go and change a belief, so for me and probably for you as well, when we're at school, there was probably a belief somewhere in there that I'm just not that bright. I'm not that smart. I don't get it. You know, that's probably, there may have been a story, a narrative. There's probably some level of belief in there. And there's probably people out there who are listening to this right now that could identify with that and have had that experience. And you'll express that. And so it becomes self-confirming because you then see the outputs that, oh, look, I got a D in the test. I'm really not that bright. So you knew it. And then you just stay stuck. You stay there. If you go and put a belief into the mind that I'm a genius or that I'm limitlessly intelligent, if you go, go and put a belief into the, into the mind, and, and I will just preface this with the way that most people work with the mind is just do that. Think, let's just put in I'm smart. If you actually go with whatever it is, the belief it is that the mind tells you that it needs to be able to express that genius, and that'll be something a bit different. But if you go and put whatever that belief is that says I'm a genius, well, once that takes root and your mind begins to express it, because the mind's egotistical, it won't go out into the world and have an experience of life. If you put in I'm a genius and then it finds itself lacking for information, it won't ever look at the world and go, oh, geez, I got that wrong. Well, I better change that belief. That was no good. It'll never do that because it's too powerful. It'll just go and change the world. That's a lot easier for it. So if you put in a belief of I am a genius, well, your mind will now just start absorbing, absorbing that information because it needs to make itself right. You're going to start absorbing information like a sponge. You won't even realize you're doing it. So I can remember the very first time this happened to me and I was literally on a podcast and we got onto a topic of conversation, which I can't remember what it was now, but at the time I just started speaking about this topic and I'd never studied it before. And I was sitting there thinking, I I've never studied this before. Where's that coming from? <laughs> and I'm in my mind, I'm having these thoughts. Am I channeling this? What is that? Like, I don't even know what that is. Like, where, like, I I'm sure I haven't learned this, but, but I know it's right. I can hear myself talking. I just, I know it's right. I was a bit freaked out. I got straight off the call and went and looked it up and researched and found like, no, it was actually all right. Okay. Everything I was saying was actually on point. And then it was like, okay, wow, okay, so these beliefs that I've been putting in about being intelligent and genius and smart, like, wow, my mind is literally going and making that my reality. Wow, okay. And so I didn't read, and that's the thing, you don't know what you know, mm -mm. but the information's in there. And if you allow it, when you need it, it'll be there. Like the information can be there for you. level, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you don't need to be walking around expressing it consciously all the time. That'd take up random access mem memory. That would take up processing capacity. It can just sit there until you actually need it. And then when you need it, you can, it, you can express it, but you would need to not be blocking it. You would need to not be denying it on any level. You'd need to be completely open to it and just allowing it to come out and express as and when it chooses to. So I hope that kind of makes some sense because that's you know, it's very different to how we've classically seen learning that, you know, learning needs to be, there needs to be physical effort and time invested in reading a book or having an experience. But if you put these things into the mind, well, the mind's limitlessly powerful. It can go to work for you and then you can just express that. And that's far more effortless. And it's just, it's a much easier and faster way to go. It's a super learning effect that occurs. And we, and what's amazing, as you said, I'm a genius. I feel the same way and I know inherently there's an inner intelligence whether you're looking at a piece of fruit you're looking at a wall most people don't look at a, a stone wall as being intelligent but mm -hmm. when you look at it at a subcellular level you see these subatomic particles and they're interacting exactly how our subatomic particles interact and you see that everything actually is and one thing with the brain that mystifies me i've, I've heard of it referred to as more of a quantum computer than necessarily a neural network 
which I know it's both, but I, I'd like to get your perspective on that. Yeah. So, so the, the brain's a quantum field, but it's, I think there's, I think there's kind of a more true way of saying it. And so there's a, a neurosurgeon by the name of Eben Alexander who had a, he wrote a book called proof of heaven and it's a beautiful book recommend reading it. If you, if you ever get the chance. Um, and he describes the brain as, as a reducing, a reducing valve or a, or a filter, a reducing filter for infinite consciousness. And it's like the way that it's, it's, it's the mechanism or it's the means in the physical body via which we're able to interact with that infinite consciousness, which is that limitless intelligence, that higher intelligence, uh, intelligence. And, and it allows us to gain a context of, you know, of that, but on a, on a much, much, much reduced scale. Um, so yes, you can have access to that. You can have access to that infinite field of information, infinite field of intelligence. And there's a level of practice that comes with that. There's a level like of actually being open to that and then practicing it and improving the capacity. Um, but absolutely via the brain, if you choose to, it's, it's very much how you choose to use it. You know, if you choose to use the brain just in your habitual ways in line with your parental programming and all the limiting beliefs that you kind of grew up with, well, that's the level of the capacity that you're pretty much experience in the brain. But if you choose to go down a path where you might be looking at meditation, it might be mindfulness, it could be, you know, looking at you know, philosophy, or you could literally just be doing up leveling in the brain, the, the kind of stuff that I do. If, Ultimately, all of those approaches will succeed because the the intention is there. Um, but there'll be there'll be a path that is right for you. There'll be a path that opens you up to that that is in a, in a far more true and a far more efficient and faster way than say some of the other paths. But very much a lot of that is just exploring and and where you notice the results unfolding faster is where you want to invest more time and more energy. Um, and where you feel peace and freedom, they're literally the guides to that. You know, it's like if I'm working and I just feel effort and resistance and it's hard, well, that's telling me that I'm not doing it right. It's kind of telling me that I'm, I'm creating that because, you know, in that infinite wisdom, in that field, well, that exists in oneness and just harmony. Like there's flow there. There's no, there's no effort to that. So if I'm experiencing effort and resistance and feeling like it's really challenging and hard, well, then I must be off track. I must be out of alignment to that somehow. And I can use that as a feedback. I can use that as a guide. So yeah, absolutely. The brain, we can say, we can call it a quantum field. We can call it like our connection to that greater quantum field. Like that's how we connect with it and how we can interact with it. Um, but it is, so that field is so much more, you know, and we said, so it's, the brain is very much just reducing that down so that we can actually have a perceptual experience and a, some level of understanding of it. And then yes, via practice and via, you know, via intentionality, we can, we can improve it and we can expand our capacity. And perception is reality when well what you perceive yeah what you perceive will be your the, the reality that you experience but think of this and this is very much i think this is it's really worth investing um just a little bit of attention into this because you no doubt will have heard and you may have even said like you'll always hear people saying you know that this is my truth that's your truth and, and right. you over there you've got your truth everybody's got their own truth that's the first law of chaos the first law of chaos is that everybody has, has their own individual truth. And that, so you think about it, if there's an infinite number of truths like that, that would be absolute chaos. That just doesn't make sense. That's insanity. So there is one truth. There's one truth, but via perception, perception determines how, how much of that or how well we can align with it, how truly we can actually see that and experience it. So perception is really limited. Perception is always partial. There's an inconceivable amount of information that goes into every single moment. So even just this now, I literally, we're just, we're two blokes, two guys on a Zoom call. There's nothing happening in either background. There's not a lot going on. We're both, we've both clearly stated we've got the intention to help. So it'd be really easy for us to think like, hey, we could, yeah, we can completely judge this and categorize it and give meaning to it and say, this is a helpful thing we're doing. This is a good thing. Yeah, that'd be really easy to do. But what goes into this moment is literally everything in your entire life's history, everything in my entire life's history that's got both of us to this point where we are, everything in the world's history that's got us to this moment, literally all of the ripple effects of change that ripple out from you, just from the information I bring into your awareness and all the ripple effects of change from the information you bring into my awareness. And, you know, and then all of the quantum entanglements to all the people, places, things that are literally that are touching each of us right now. And we have no perception of any of that. 
So we like our perception is not covering any of that. We're just literally sort of seeing, yes, a visual stimulus and auditory stimulus. And oh, yes, God, this guy, he seems like a nice enough guy. Yeah. I can't think this is a good thing. So based on just a fraction of a percentage of the total of the information, we're convinced we've got the whole picture and we're ready to judge it and say, yep. Okay. This is true. This is good. And it would be like saying that, you look at your visual system and you look at visual perception, like the visual spectrum accounts for about 1%, roughly about 1% of what's out there, but you can't not believe what you see. And we have the saying that seeing is believing. Like if you see it, you're going to believe it, but you're literally right. seeing about 1% of the information and you're convinced, you know, what's going on. So perception is incredibly partial and the best and the most powerful way we can approach life is if we can literally just step back and say, you know what? I don't actually know the meaning of anything I perceive. I literally, I don't like, because my perception is a fraction of a percentage of any information. And if I don't have all of the information in a situation, how can I possibly judge the situation? Like I can't possibly judge it if I don't have all the information and I fundamentally via perception, I can't get that. So you know what? I, I don't know the meaning of anything I perceive, which means I now I can't judge. And that gets me out of the past. That gets me out of being locked in my past perception, past meaning, the things that have made me stuck or things that have made me feel stressed or you know, hurt or traumatized or any of that stuff. That gets me out of that. And then I can look at it and say, well, hang on. It's my perception that drives my thought process. Like what I perceive kind of drives what I think. And if I'm now being made aware that what I perceive is largely inaccurate, well, that would mean not one thought I have is wholly true. So it's like, okay, where does that lead me? And then, so if I can look at that, then really... I can't, that means I can't judge. I can't possibly judge. So 100% of the judgments that I try and make, no matter how clear cut, no matter how right I feel, they're going to be wrong because my perception is this big. And if I can be humble about that and just step back and say, I don't know the meaning, then now I can just ask for truth. And the truth will come in the form of peace and form of freedom and literally increased capacity. And, and again, you're going to lose stress. You're going to drop stress when you do that. As soon as you start dropping stress, that brain gets more capable because a brain that is literally that is, is is perceiving stress is literally less intelligent. You're shutting down, you're losing access. Like you do immediately, you shunt blood from the prefrontal cortex back to the brainstem and mm. you start becoming more sort of, you know, survival based, survival focused, more animalistic in your, you know, in your decision making and you're more reflexive, more reflexively oriented. Your thought process too, you know, like, yeah, absolutely. You know you're, you're in that state. I, I couldn't, get a clear thought across. Like I, I couldn't, can hardly even figure out how to get from point A to point B at that time. It's because yep. it's pure survival state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. So the idea, this is the thing. So the idea that we've only got that there's that everybody has their individual truth. That's the first law of chaos that just locks us into chaos and literally just locks us into suffering. And, you know, we're going to deal with trauma and stress and all that sort of stuff kind of ad infinitum. If we can step back and say, wait a minute, there's one truth. And via my perception, if I allow it, I can begin to train my perception to actually connect with that truth and peace is the guide. So where I start to experience peace and where I start to experience freedom, that's freedom. That's going to guide me to what is actually really true. Um, and if I can allow that, well, then, yeah, we can actually come into resonance with that truth. And in that truth, you think that's the true self. The true self exists in truth. The, true, the, the truth of the universe, which is perfect, exists in that truth. That's where all of your joy, all your fulfillment, all your success, all your you know higher states of being, you know, all of that stuff is where that's where you're going to experience that. So our perception, we can say we can say that perception determines your reality if you buy into it. Okay, so what you perceive determines your your experience of reality. But if I look at that, and I like to call it your asleep perception, if you if you don't realize that that's a choice. And it is very much a choice. And uh, this is what I do with people in one-on-one -on -one sessions is you literally end up just going past and just dissolving that. So you don't actually have to deal with the, the asleep perception anymore is if you're just accepting and wholly believing in the emotions that come up in a stress response or a defensive reaction or in a triggering situation. Uh, and you tell yourself that is true because that's literally all you're experiencing. Like that's all the sensory noise that you're experiencing in a, in a, in a moment of an emotional response. Well, it's going to feel real but it has nothing to do with truth. Mm -hmm. It feels really, really real, but it has absolutely nothing to do with truth. It's just the loudest noise that's in your sensory awareness in that moment. And so if we can sort of step back and actually go, wait a minute, that's not true because I don't know the meaning of anything I perceive. Okay, so what's true? What's the truth? And somewhere in my awareness will be peace 
and I can focus on that piece, even if it's only 1% of what I can perceive, as soon as I place my attention on that 1%, it's going to expand to 10%. And then I place my attention on that 10%, it's going to expand further to 20 or 30. Because where your attention goes, your energy flows and neural connection grows. And, and you'll literally be, begin to perceive more and more and more of that. So that's an easy way to start to get yourself to real truth. Um, it's just allow, we have to just allow ourselves to be with it. It's very, very well said. I just know one thing. The one thing I know is, is that I don't know very much. <laughs> and when, when I can look at that aspect of humility, humility is the true essence of how we learn because when mm -hmm. we when we feel like we will not learn from every situation or every single person it's going to block us off it, it puts in that blockade to our subconscious or conscious awareness that there's anything to be gained from this experience so i'm just going to shut off my thinking area of the brain thinking cortex or however our brain processes that information and the main thing i always I always go back to is like i said i i realize i'm smart i'm capable but at the same time i realize that i know very little and that's what keeps me motivated to learn on a moment to moment basis yeah awesome and that humility is beautiful and the thing with humility to remember is humility never never demands never asks that you just accept littleness or that you accept inferiority or, or smallness or anything like that it never ever 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 asks for that so that's something human that's in that's misinterpreted a lot with humility people think that i need to kind of self-minimize or put myself down or say i'm not good enough not smart enough not right. this it's like humility never is it, it never asks for littleness but it's not content with anything less than greatness so because and that greatness isn't necessarily of you that is that truth of the universe truth of who you are that higher level of self higher level of mind which you have the ability to tap into and kind of connect with so that greatness is inherent within each of us it's in it's in it's there and it's available if i tell myself that being humble is telling myself that i'm not good enough or that i'm not greater i'm not not this not that because I don't want to, you know, upset others by telling myself that I'm good and make them feel yeah. that they're not, that's all just false noise. That's all just made up. So we can just literally be humble and say like, exactly like you say, I don't know. I don't actually have the answer. So if I don't know, I can ask for truth. And again, that peace, what brings me peace, what brings me freedom, freedom will be, will be my guide to finding it, you know, and I can begin to connect with it. And again, that can sound really abstract. It can sound, you know, really ambiguous when, when you kind of say that, but think of this there are people who much like myself can make really really big important decisions based on intuitive feedback you know because we've been listening to it for a long time and there is this higher intelligence that's just always right and if you learn how to tap into it and even in a stressful state you learn how to get past the stress so that you can actually just tap into that intuitive wisdom that wisdom will be there that intelligence will be there and you can have the answers in that moment so that is absolutely available so you can always ask for truth and think of how your brain works as soon as you perceive something if you can perceive like i keep talking about peace as the guide or the freedom as the guide as soon as you can connect with information on that level well every time you connect with it you're forming new synaptic connections around that frequency of information which means the next time that you experience it you're just that little bit more capable and then when you perceive it again you're going to strengthen those connections and make more Again, the next time you're going to be more capable. So it starts to come into your awareness more frequently. You begin to recognize it more clearly. You begin to have more of an understanding of it. So at first, when you hear someone like myself talking about that and you say, like, and they keep banging on about truth, you know, peace is the guide to truth. Mm -hmm. And you find yourselves going, well, what does that even mean? I've never experienced that. Well, the first thing is just slowing down and allowing it because that first little snippet of peace that you experience, if you allow your attention to just come to rest on that, well, you're forming new synaptic connections between neurons around that level of information, around that frequency of information, which makes you more capable of experiencing it again and again and again. And so you can begin to build that capacity. And that's a really simple way to kind of build intuition, build an intuitive process within the self. Yeah, I, I believe the one, a big aha moment I had 
about learning about the brain was thinking of it as almost as carving a path in a forest. You have a path that's already firmly construed and people are all, everybody wants to go down that because it looks, feels safe and it, it's groomed and it's well known and there's not as much chance of a, a tiger attacking you. But that yet if we carve a different path, it's going to be tough at first. We got to get our machete out. We got to chop through and it's going to suck for a long time. However, we reach a certain point where we've carved out enough area. And that's how I think of the brain is we carved it out and then it just becomes second nature and easy. Yeah. But uh, again, you know what? I would start with that intention because you, so you're seeing it there. And I think you're seeing it really truly when you say like, yeah, it becomes second nature and it becomes easy. And like, you're right. Like you, cause then the, it's like the brain's doing the work. It, it knows what to do and it's guiding it for you. If you set the intentionality for that ease and you allow that to be the feedback rather than I think kind of what you may have just described is just something that's really common in our society. As in we say, you know what? I need to apply effort to this. I need to apply force to this. And this needs to like, this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard work. I'm going to dig in. And then because that's what I'm looking for that I'm now using that as my guide. So I, I tell myself, okay, this feels tough. This feels hard. Right. I must be on the right track. Yes. This, cause now I'm doing something different. I know I'm going in a different direction and I'm using that as my guide. I'm just going to go and find more of that. I'm going to find more of that and find more of that. Until probably like you described, eventually I come into, I have some level of awakening and then I recognize like, Oh, a flow state. Oh, this feels easy. Oh, I think I've arrived. Okay. Oh, and then maybe I switch. Then maybe I change and I start looking for that peace and that ease and that flow as the guide, but you can do that straight away. We don't need to separate ourselves from the result with time, or we don't need to separate ourselves and push the result away with, you know, with effort or sacrifice. We just don't need to do that. We can actually, like you think you're dealing, you're dealing with an instrument that is limitlessly powerful already knows how to get the result already knows how to get where you want to get to. You don't consciously understand that, but it knows. So if you can somehow get yourself out of the way and allow it to guide you, you might be on that effortless path right, path right from the beginning. But if, if you are feeling like, Hey, I need to be the one in the driver's seat and the way forward that I know is hard work. Well, that's yeah. what we're going to experience. I think maybe that's wisdom that comes along with, under understanding for for me i you know when you're a young dude you you just feel like brute force is the way mm. and everything you want to lift the, yep. the, the heavy weights you want to just pound forward but then you realize at the end of the day it's maybe it could have been a little easier yeah it's the young bull and the old bull <laughs> yeah <laughs> it sure so. is man um yeah I, I just want to dive into some questions that i have uh, want to learn more about uh, what would you say this this is just kind of this is very specific question but what I never understood about GABA you, you understand um, the neurotransmitter GABA right so why when you take GABA why does it not break through the, the blood brain barrier so depending on any, for any supplement, any supplement, it depends on how supplements are packaged because look at some, I think the really simple way to understand this is you look at like things like omega threes and food, like how they're packaged when, when omega threes are packaged in seafood and shellfish, it's, it's packaged in a way that it can cross the blood brain barrier. You can put it in terms of a fish oil, you're taking a capsule and that package no longer, it literally no longer fits the filter. It doesn't, it, it literally doesn't get across, doesn't get across. You can't actually use it. And supplement companies will be happy to sell these things to you all day long because they're really happy. You know, the, we can do studies and say, Hey, look what GABA does. You know, look what, you know, look what omega threes do. Look what the serotonin does. Look at, look at all these things and look what they do. And we can show you the studies, but how well are you able to access that? How well are you able to absorb that? And if, if it's not packaged in such a way that you're actually able to absorb it and make use of it, well, you're just not getting the effect. So it's, it's dealing, it's, and this is the thing I think. So one of the things I remember doing quite a while ago was um, just working with transmutation and like literally being able to, we, we can transmutate all of these things within the body. We can make all of these things within the body and we don't actually need to take the supplements so much we need to actually open up the reopen the capacity 
to be able to make these things. And so calibrating the nervous system and literally changing the thoughts and the thought patterns and the beliefs that you hold in the mind actually do all of that. And so if you can actually be your own pharmacy and making all of those things, well, then there's nothing to stop that. It's coming from within you. And that's kind of how it was designed to work in the first place. So I, that, that has really been my experience that if we, if you have the belief in the system, and again, your mind will, it'll be a specific belief to you that your mind will know exactly what it'll be or a combination of beliefs. Um, if the neurophysiology is calibrated in such a way that everything is just, there's open communication, you can make all these things and you can literally just run along and, and, you know, run along on a really, on a really sustainable clip and you won't actually need to be topping up with anything. Um, that has really truly been my experience. And for that reason, I, I, I don't, I don't discourage supplementation by any stretch, but it's not something that I really go into. And again, the way that I work with people is very much asking the mind, ask the brain. You're literally tapping in and, and asking the system, getting feedback from the systems. And like, what do you want? What do you need to hear? What do you need to be at your best? And it's really rare. It's really rare that I'll kind of get a physical supplement that comes back. You know, sometimes and in for a short period of time, yes, that can come up. But a lot of times, if it comes up as like in post session, if it comes up as a as a resource, and that's what a supplement would fall, it would fall under as a, a resource that would you'd use to assist you as you're integrating the changes from the work we've done. Most of the resources that come up will be emotional. It'll be joy. It'll be gratitude. It'll be things that put. It'll be play. It'll be it'll be something that puts you in a state where you're going to generate and make all those things yourself. And your mind knows that and it'll kind of give that to you. So I think, so basically in short, to answer your question, you're really just looking at, look to take things from natural sources and some things it can be, it, the natural source can be movement. Natural source can be emotion. Natural source can be like emotional states and can be states you know, of togetherness and whatnot. But um, if you look to those natural stimulants and those natural sources, you can kind of get a far more true result. Um, as I said, not discouraging supplements. And if doctors have gone and put you on the, you know, on those things and okay, great. Hey, follow the prescription and everything, but keep asking the questions, keep seeking towards truth. Because if you're, if you're taking the supplements, if you're on a program and it's not bringing you the peace or not bringing you the freedom in the body that you're desiring, well, you need to keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love, I feel the same way. We, we have this miraculous gift of the brain and the heart and the body and it's just amazing. We, when we, we can create our own pharmacy, uh, you know, we create our own neurochemicals through our thoughts, through our actions and emotions. It's just a, a very fascinating to me um, how change occurs, change, how to make change happen quicker and more efficiently. I, yeah. Can I just I add to that? To kinda, I think, wait, go ahead. Well, I think you just, you just touched on something that's really important. And I think if you are taking supplements and that's something, you know, and like loads and loads of people are, it's really important to just have it in your awareness because when you take a supplement, it's kind of the same as going to the doctor and getting a medication. And it's like, it's like you're giving your power away is the classic words. You know, it's like you're going there and saying like, I don't have any influence over this. I can't do this. I need to take an external thing. It will fix me. And, I, and I'm just kind of washing my hands of it. But that's fundamentally not true. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking the supplement, but you probably want to acknowledge like, okay, you know what? All these results coming from me, I'm doing this. I'm just adding this little extra thing, which is just going to give me a little bit of help, you know, but, but I'm the one like this in here, I'm doing this. My body is what's going to, is going to facilitate this change that I want. If I'm just, if I'm literally there assigning properties of mind to the body. The body doesn't have a mind. The body's just passive. It's literally responding to whatever the mind is telling it. So if I'm holding a belief that I have no power over this and I can't change things, but I need this external thing to help, well, I'm literally just relying on that. And then whatever thoughts I have, if they're negative, I'm, things probably aren't going to go so well. If the thoughts are really positive and aligned, well, I might get a, a better result. But if at the very least I can acknowledge like, no, no, the power's within me. I've got this, like, this is, this is, uh, I'm a healing machine or I, my, you know, my body is in its optimal state. My body is in its, you know, highest state, greater state of communication. And I'm taking this little supplement to help. Hey, great. Awesome. Like you're going to get a better result than if I sort of step back and say, look, I've got no power over this. I've, I'm going to need to take six different supplements and three medications and just hope for the best. Absolutely. And the essence, there's, there's no difference between 
becoming reliant on that that substance versus talking about your own mental power. So it, there is a limitation to that to, to a certain extent. I also wanted to dive into trauma. I know you, you discuss trauma a lot and I've learned quite a bit from you. I have been interested in the self-sabotage recently because it, I found that it did occur to me last summer. Um, I was doing really well. And if you had talked to me five years ago, Scott, I would have had trouble piecing together simple sentences, to be quite mm -hmm. honest with you. I had a lot of brain trauma and <laughs> I still do it from time to time, but I that plasticity that occurred allowed me to have this conversation that I'm having with you today. But when it comes to trauma and self-sabotage and discomfort and those things that the, the brain doesn't like, like what is the neural mechanism that actually creates that dissonance there that makes me revert to old behaviors, uh, even though I thought I was way past them? Mm. So again, you're talking about sort of like just habitually hardwired circuits and habitually hardwired patterns. Now, one of the things, if you have trauma, then that's going to exist in, it'll exist throughout the entirety of your system because it's an open system. But we focus on the limbic brain. We know the limbic brain, we call it the emotional brain. Now, the limbic brain, the limbic system is, it's like the most connected, influential neurologic system. So if you have an altered bioelectric charge, which is what you'll experience if you have a trauma, then that will exist in the limbic brain and all of its structures, but it'll exist everywhere. You'll, you'll, you'll find it in the somatic nervous system. And so that's when people talk about somatic release therapy. And it's like, you know, people who say they go and have a massage and you go and you massage, you know, the hip flexors, and then all of a sudden you start crying and have a big emotional release. You're not necessarily healing anything. You're just letting go of some stored energy that's actually in the, the hip flexor or that's in that. And that's a correlation. You're looking at correlations in the somatic nervous system that, that kind of trace their way back to the source of the trauma, which in the physical body is probably stored somewhere in the limbic system. There's different divisions of the, of the limbic system there. Now, when we talk about self-sabotage, you're just talking about patterns. And the thing is your subconscious mind will have set up for you that what you're doing, you're, so you're exhibiting a pattern, exhibiting a habit that is really unhelpful. So that's why we call it sabotage. So you, there's a really unhelpful pattern that doesn't serve you, doesn't serve your highest good, but your subconscious mind has managed to twist it around somehow to tell you that it's beneficial. And so on some deep level, you believe that you're actually giving yourself a benefit. And so it's for that reason, when you, when you experience self-sabotage, a lot of the time, you can't actually see it. You don't realize it. And then when someone tries to call you out on it or tries to help, you can get some really strong pushback from people on that because they actually believe, you know, they believe that you're trying to harm this helpful pattern they've set up for themselves, which is actually self-sabotage. They just can't see it. So we call it a secondary gain and you will hang on to a secondary gain for as long as you continue to see it as beneficial. So for as long as you believe that it's actually truly serving you, even though it's harmful, you believe it's truly serving you, you'll hang on to it because again, you, your, your mind is placing a level of importance on that. Cause it, again, it sees it as beneficial. So the things that you give importance to is where you, those are the things that you will direct your willpower towards. So you'll direct, you'll place your attention, you'll place your energy on those things and you'll direct your willpower. You will choose for those things. So the way, a really simple way of kind of looking at about trying to get out of it is you, you want to start with your desire. You want to place, you want to get clear about your desire. If it's healing, if it's best self, if it's best life, if it's just love relationships and intimacy, whatever it is that you truly, truly desire, then you want to place your attention on that. And that's a really simple question. Just ask people, ask yourself, look in the mirror and say, what do you want? Like, what do you actually want? And it's never a material thing. It's never a, Hey, I want a red sports car or, you know, I want to, you know what? I want to go to the gym and I just want to get jacked. Like it's never, it's never anything physical material. It's that's that those things aren't real and true. You'll be looking for a real, true front fundamental, but it'll be, look, you know what? I just want peace in my life. You know what? I just want joy. Actually, you know what? I want connection. I really just want emotional connection. Actually, I want abundance. You know, it'll be stuff like that. It'll be just these real deep, just fundamentals that you can just place it, place your attention on. And then that higher intelligence can literally populate. So if I say I want joy in my life, well, I don't know the meaning of anything I perceive. So I need to just step back and say, hey, I don't really know how joy is going to come. I, don't, I have no idea the, the best way that joy could be for me. I'm just going to place my, my attention on joy. That's my desire. 
And now I am going to consciously make that important to me. I'm going to give importance to joy. So anything else that comes up, don't care. I don't care whatever else comes up. If there's a choice between joy and anything else, I'm choosing joy because I'm giving importance to that. And I will direct my, my willpower, my energy, my attention towards joy. So get clear about what it is that you want. As soon as you have a desire, desire is like a seed. Everything, all of the mechanics that unfold, all the potentiality of that desire are inherent within the desire itself. Exactly the same as within a tree, as in a seed. The seed, all the mechanics that unfold that seed to make into a great big tree are inherent. Yes, it's going to have to pull resources in from outside, but all the mechanics to unfold it and make it happen are, are, are there. And desire is exactly the same. So if you just give it importance, and that means you're going to come back and choose for it, it means you're going to nourish it. You're going to come back and just give it a little bit of water. You're going to give it some nutrients. Then you will manifest that desire. That's literally what you will manifest in your life. And so that's at a real basic do it yourself kind of level. That's a really simple way to go about getting past um, self-sabotage because you can then notice, hang on, this thing that I thought was really beneficial. It's not taking me to the thing that I want. Ah, there's a clear choice here. Okay. Well, I thought that was good, but I just want my desire. So I'm going to go to that. And then that's literally the way that you can go about it. So you can start to unwind these things. And that's just really helpful. It's really simple. And would that be the same way that you would look at getting past overwhelm? So overwhelm it can be for a number of different things, but you think what we we're talking about before, when we we're talking about the brain being in stress. So as soon as you are stressed, think of this. So we say, as soon as your brain is perceiving stress, there's a stressful perception in your awareness, immediately your brain, your prefrontal cortex, which we like to look at, you know, in, and again, in medical science, we were neuroscience, we would look at the pre, prefrontal cortex and call that the conscious mind. We say that's the most highly evolved part of the mind. That's your executive centers where you're doing all of your critical thinking and processing. Immediately, you're losing blood. You're losing blood to that area and it's being shunted back to the brainstem, which is the most ancient part of the brain, call that the reptilian brain. And that's literally where you're just coming up with survival based decisions. So immediately, you will be less intelligent. Now, that means you have less brain processing capacity available to you in that moment. So that means that your threshold straight away, you're getting way closer to your threshold for overwhelm. So if my threshold for overwhelm is kind of up here somewhere and I'm running along, I'm all peace and calm. And I, let's say, let's just put numbers to it. My threshold for overwhelm is 100 and I'm just operating at a stress level of zero to 10 life's good. I've got a, I've got a big buffer, you know, like I can experience some stresses. I'm still going to be able to think and process. But then if I encounter some stressful perceptions and straight away, I start losing brain processing capacity. Well, the stress that I'm perceiving goes up and let's say I'm now existing at like a 70 to 80. Well, I'm just kind of just below that threshold for overwhelm. So I only need, it might not be more stress, but I just might need someone just comes and asks an extra question or just throws an extra task at me. You know, I think I'm coping with my day. And then my wife comes and says, hey, can you fold the washing? And all of a sudden you have a big emotional reaction because <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know, I'm, I'm just below that threshold for overwhelm, you know? And so, and that can literally just come down to stressful perceptions. So when we can understand that, again, healing is a true path. You can completely heal those perceptions. So you just don't perceive stress anymore. You can literally just perceive peace or freedom in those moments. Um, but even just understanding that, understanding what's going on like ah oh, there's must be stressful perceptions in my awareness that's got me to overwhelm so right now in this moment i'm less capable and this is the thing i think what you were describing before when you were saying um you were dealing with just trying to fix things by adding more effort and just forcing through and i'm going to push through so my yeah, brain's in stress i am less capable by definition i'm less intelligent in this moment but you know what don't care. I'm going to push on. I'm going to push it. I will do this. Damn it. And that's a hard road. That's a really hard road. And it generally ends in frustration and, and often collapse. So if we can just in that moment, we can just <clears throat> slow down and get still and say, okay, you know what? How about I do some breathing? How about I just kind of sit and see if I can achieve heart brain coherence or achieve a whole brain state. I don't even need to know how or why or whatever I'm doing. I can just sit and be still and just breathe and get calm there's a bunch of different strategies we can employ with, you know, breathing techniques and whatnot. Um, but if we can do that and just slow things down, immediately you're going to recover some brain processing capacity and you're probably going to feel a bit more capable. And that can just be a smarter and easier way to go. Absolutely. I, we all get in that state sometimes and that lizard brain state. And sometimes I'll, it's like, you know, that moment to be a little funny here. It's like, you know, 
when you're running out in in the middle of the street with your underwear and it's like you don't know how you got there type of thing. <laughs> but, um, I it's been a while since I've experienced that, but yeah, <laughs> for me, you know, it's it's been an interesting road. I uh, I wanted to really dive deeply into what your routine looked like, just because out of sheer curiosity, you you exude such a really cool way of a uh, high level brain performance and you make it look so easy. I, I just had to dig deep into what is it an average day look like for you? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's just start from fundamental principles. So fundamental principles, I'm a big believer in it's all about working smart, not hard. You, there's nothing wrong with working hard, but as long as we're working smart, you know, so, you know, and, and again, that, that, that was, coming into that awareness as a, as a young man overturning my parental programming as I was, you know, my father was very much someone about, no, mate, hard work, suffer. It's all about there's virtue in suffering, work hard. Don't, you know, just, and it's, I think that's a lot of people work that way and sort of, and they, they use that as the feedback. They're just looking to, right. Is the effort level like high? Sacrifice. Or yeah. Is the effort level high? Is the sacrifice level, level high? Yes. Good. I must be on track. So, but we can work smart. So, simple daily routine for me is wake up first thing don't look at the phone phone doesn't go on for me until generally after I've done my first session so i'll generally wake up um have a cuddle with my wife trying to have you know some happy emotions you know happy loving emotions now the order that i might wake up and have the the lying in bed time with my wife first for at least a few minutes and then get up and go meditate or i might if i wake up early i'll go meditate first and then generally i'll try and come back come back and lie down for, you know, for a few moments and just have that level of connection. Um, and so that's important. But again, the phone doesn't go on. The phone doesn't go on until generally for me after I've finished my first session. So I might wake up at six or wake up at seven. My phone generally won't get turned on until about 9.30, 10.30 in the morning. Now, that's something that's actually really important because intentionality for your day is key. So I'll generally in that meditation get up and I'll just ask questions like, right, what's, what's right for me? What do I need to focus on? Or what do I need to be letting go of? Or what do I need to allow to come into my understanding? Or what do I need to forget? So I'll kind of ask some questions and just allow my mind to kind of get centered. And then I'll generally come away with, you know, I've got my overall, my overarching intention, which is I just want to be helpful. And then because my mind is focusing on that, it can pull into awareness of how that's going to happen. I can start to get the how. And that will start to crystallize for me generally in the morning. And so I'll start to get an idea of how my day wants to go and how things want to be directed. And then I'll go and try and be helpful, helping people. At some point I'll generally exercise. Same thing with exercise is I used to go via that just work really hard rather than smart. So generally now I will work on, I'll do a few neurologic stimulations to kind of just turn the brain on, do some vestibular stimulations like, like rolling and rocking. I'll do some um, visual motor drills, literally having your eyes doing some crazy things going side to side and moving around in circles and all this sort of stuff. Just really turn the brain on because I can invest five minutes there and you can get a significantly improved performance out of the body. You just don't need to do as much. So then you don't need to stress the tissues as much. I'll try and anything I do in movement will be, generally there'll be a level of of novelty about it i'm always trying to do something new because that forces the brain to pay attention so i'm just trying to be conscious and be aware of where the patterns where the where the habit might exist and then get outside that just get outside that so my brain's actually having to try and process something new and, and understand it um food wise i don't focus so much on the physical because i've come to this understanding that literally everything is mind and so I'll try and eat fruit and I'll try it. I'd try not to eat unhealthy. Um, yeah, you, really... you're not going to find you at McDonald's or anything like that. Very yeah, well, look, there may be a couple of times a year. My, my kids, when my, my kids <laughs> say McDonald's is the, is the reward if they've achieved a trophy at something. And so there'll be, you know, if, they've, if somebody's won something. Well, then, yeah, or like you know, the tequila in the McDonald's parking lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's generally not me. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't place so much emphasis on food. Um, I place emphasis on light. So that's part of what I do. My kids, you know, they roll their eyes at me because every day that, you know, they get up and I say, dad's there saying, have you looked at the light? Have you been outside? You go out and kind of set your circadian rhythm. Now we can do that via neurology. You can literally go and set your body clock in an instant, but you just going out and seeing sunlight, sunlight and seeing all spectrums of light, like at, at a cellular level, 
like it's, it's a huge amount of cellular cellular communication is biophotonic. It means that your cells are communicating via light. So that would mean that the type of light that you put in is really important. If you put in false lights from fluorescence and LEDs, well, that's telling your telling your body clock, that's telling your circadian real, telling your um, telling your suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the master clock, it's telling it that it's a certain time of day. It's giving it a false cue. If you get out and you look at the sunlight early in the morning, and then in the evening, then you're actually cueing the body a certain way. And so everything in your system works in harmony with these chronobiological processes, and it works to a clock, to a cl- to clock rhythms. And if you allow that light in, then you actually optimize all of those processes. And you just find the body works a whole lot more easily. So again, really simple things you can do in terms of getting out and I'll just, you know, get out early in the morning, stick my feet in the grass, look at the sunlight for a while, meditate, come back in, either have a cuddle, go to work. You know, at some point I'll do some exercise. There'll generally be multiple points during the day where I'm just checking in. Is there anything for personal growth? Is there anything that I, you know, and there'll be reading at some point. Um, and then there'll be different things I do with my kids. And again, that's really joyful for me uh, to actually doing some learning things with my, with my little girl at the moment about learning how to learn. Um, my little boy will go out and do some running training because he just wants to be an athlete. And, and the little one who he just wants to throw a ball, throw a ball and catch or whatever, or have a tickle, have a run around. And so I just try and get those things done, just sort of check the fundamentals. And my life's gotten really simple. You know, it's just really sort of just simplify it down to the things that are really, that are really, really important. You know, so those things with my kids are important. Those things with those different processes and setting up the mind and, you know, and literally sort of personal and, you know, personal, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual growth and development. There's something being taken care of there each day. Um, you know, and just paying attention to those things and then just being helpful, being able to help people, you know, every day, either on social or in one-to-one sessions. Um, and when you're living true to purpose, again, literally everything in your cellular expression is improved. And so like you will have health and you'll have vitality and you probably find yourself actually needing less sleep and all these things. And that's very much what I experience. And, and then I can use that as a feedback. I definitely notice those moments if I'm off track from that. And then it's like, ah, oh, okay, something needs to be paid attention to so I can adjust it. Um, so hopefully that just gives some level of awareness for a bunch of things that I deem to be important to me. Um, and if there's anything there that kind of resonates or that you feel you see you can apply in your own life or you know, lives of anyone who's listening, then hopefully that's something you can make use of. I love it. And I, I really like how you talk about waking the break, but the brain up through light and through simulating the vestibular system or the motor cortex and things of that area that really, really interests me. And the simplicity aspect too is, is very powerful. Uh, well, I, it's been a wonderful chat to kind of wrap it up in a more lighthearted manner. I, what, if you could be one superhero, which superhero would that be and why? <laughs> as a kid, as a kid, I always, I, I always focused on Superman, but there was Superman and Luke Skywalker were probably the, the two. So if there was some, if there was some combination of those two, um, you know, it's like the power, the, the power of the mind that the Jedi Knight seemed to seem, seemed to have that just always fascinated me. I think Superman, just because he could fly. I thought that was just, that was amazing. But I think, you know, it's like doing this healing work with people and you're working with the mind. Um, you know, that's one of the things, one of the names you get called, you get called a Jedi or you get called a, you know, tell, people tell you you've got Jesus hands or tell you, you know, that, you know, you, you're exhibiting superhero abilities or whatever, but it's so much of it is just opening up to that limitlessness that's inside and not, you know, not telling the limitlessness how it's supposed to behave and what it's supposed to look like. You know, we can just, like we said, I don't know the meaning of anything I perceive. That means I can just sit back and just question like, okay, how limitless, how limitless am I? What does that look like? Where's it going to go? What's it, you know, what's next. Um, and so, yeah, for me, like literally that, uh, um, if there's a, if there's a mix between Luke Skywalker and Superman um, and Jesus, I'm in. <laughs> I love it. Scott, thank you so much for having, uh, coming on to, to, chat with me and i just want to ask you where can we find you on social and what is uh the close future look like for you yeah so look the brain guy the dot brain dot guy on instagram facebook um yeah happy to connect with people if you got questions or whatever um 
Yeah, I guess at the moment there's a whole bunch of different things on the horizon. You know, there's there's a there's a book I'm kind of writing. There's um, a couple of programs I'm sort of looking at in terms of sort of putting together more of a community so I can hopefully sort of direct more of the help that I've got that can just be hopefully more impactful. Um, but in the short term, like same thing, I'm just working with individuals and just you just able to change lives in ways that people weren't really aware was even possible. Um, and that's just something that's really just motivating and really joyful for me, you know, actually better share that with people. So, um, that's kind of the space you'll find me in. Beautiful Scott. Thank you for coming on and, uh, we'll, we'll catch you around. Hopefully we'll have you back on at some point. Cheers, mate. Thanks very much for the conversation, sir.